die suffering at the hands of Rome cause they believed in Christ alone they died through Europe especially Spain for they saw all but Christ is vain he suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin 600 years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening, my name's Tom Press, and this is Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. Again, my name is Tom Press, the regular host of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and I've been asked by Walt Stickle to come and host the reading of this book, Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy, by Henry Grattan Guinness. And as typical, we will have one hour of reading from the text of this book, plus my commentary. And at the end of that hour, we'll take a five-minute break, and then uh, we will begin, hopefully, a fruitful discussion about the book or about the reading for tonight. Last time, we concluded at the top of page 279, if you're following along in the, in lo the online version of this book from the University of Toronto, uh, Romanism and the Reformation from the University of Toronto, and uh, we will pick up there and continue our reading. And what we were discussing was the beliefs, or rather the interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel, of Paul, and of John uh, regarding the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. What did the post Protestant reformer, what, the, what did the post-Protestant Reformation Bible believers believe about these prophecies? What did they believe and teach? And you'll find that they were absolutely consistent with the historical interpretation of Bible believers all throughout the centuries from our time all the way back to apostolic times. And they believed that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the Antichrist, were none other than the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Now we'll continue with the post-Protestant Reformation interpreters of the prophecies, and currently we're speaking about uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And in the first full paragraph on page 279, continuing our discussion about what Sir Isaac Newton believed, Sir Isaac Newton says this, he points out that an angel must fly through the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach to all nations before Babylon falls and the Son of Man reaps his harvest and says, quote, If the general preaching of the gospel is approaching, it is to us and to our posterity that those words mainly belong. In the time of the end, the wise shall understand, but none of the wicked shall understand. Blessed is he that readeth, 
and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, close quotes. How marvelously has Sir Isaac Newton's anticipation of a general preaching of the gospel been accomplished in the glorious evangelization of the world during the last century. This judicious writer expressed as his opinion to Whiston, his learned successor, that the Church of Rome was destined to be overthrown by a tremendous infidel revolution. In other words, that superstition should be trodden down by infidelity, that the Roman Catholic Church would be trodden down by infidels, in other words, total unbelievers. Now, remembering that Sir Isaac Newton died half a century before the French Revolution, this was a very remarkable anticipation. Now, you hear what Henry Grattan Guinness is saying? He's saying that Sir Isaac Newton, by reading and understanding the prophecies of the book of, of Daniel and Paul and John, and, and John understood that the, the whore and the, and the beast upon which she rode would be trodden down or defeated by an infidel rebellion, by the French Revolution. It, it, it's obvious that they predicted the French Revolution. Now, it says one of the most important features of Sir Isaac Newton's work is its exposition of the use of symbolic language in prophecy. He lays it down as a principle that, quote, for understanding the prophecies, we are in the first place to acquaint ourselves with the figurative language of the prophets. This language is taken from the analogy between the world natural and an empire or kingdom considered as a world politic, unquote. The prophecies of Daniel and the apocalypse being symbolic in their language are not to be interpreted literally. In these books, the sun, moon, stars, earth, fire, meteors, Winds, storms, hail, lightning, rain, waters, sea, rivers, floods, dry land, overflowing of waters, drying up of waters, fountains, islands, trees, mountains, wilderness, beasts, as the lion, bear, and the leopard, and the he-goat, with their horns, Heads, feet, wings, and teeth, etc., are all symbolic. They are simple. They are symbols of things of a different nature, though things analogous to these, or in some sense resembling them. On this principle, for example, the two witnesses of the Book of Revelation in chapter 11 are symbolic and not to represent two actual men from whose mouth literal fire proceeds, and who literally shut heaven, and literally turn waters to blood, and smite the earth with literal plagues, and who are slain and lie dead for three and a half literal days, and then literally rise from the dead, and literally and visibly ascend to heaven in a cloud nor is their ascension followed by a literal earthquake and a literal fall of the tenth part of a literal city and by literal lightnings, voices, thunderings, and hail. All these are symbols of other things, and their literal interpretation is an absurdity. Futurists, futurists, utterly degrade these solemn and majestic predictions by their pernicious attempts to expound them on the principle of a literal fulfillment. The first step in the direction of the comprehension of these prophecies is the the consistent recognition of their symbolic character. A sufficient number of these symbols are 
divinely interpreted for us to serve as a clue to all the rest, as when a beast is explained to represent a kingdom and a candlestick, a local church. The second step to a comprehension of symbolic prophecy is the settlement of the meaning of the various symbols which they employ. Contemporaneous with Sir Isaac Newton, there were several great Huguenot expositors of prophecy. Now remember, the Huguenots were French Calvinist Protestants who lived in France and worshipped God according to spirit and in truth in a Roman Catholic country in France. And the only way that they were able to do that is because of the Edict of Nantes that gave religious liberty to France. Otherwise, the Huguenots would have been persecuted in France. And eventually, that is exactly what happened. Now, he says again, contemporaneous with Sir Isaac Newton, living at the same time as Sir Isaac Newton, there were several great Huguenot expositors of prophecy. Among these, I may name Giraud and Dabas. Both these were exiled Huguenots and belonged to the 500,000 Protestants who were compelled to leave France by the persecuting action of King Louis XIV in revoking the Edict of Nantes. Their sufferings under the papal power turned their attention to the prophetic word, and in it they found support and consolation. Giraud, for example, begins his prophetic work with the sentence, quote, The afflicted church seeks for consolation. Where can she find it but in the promises of God? Unquote. Here is a copy of this work. Here again, Henry Grattan Guinness is holding up another book. You've got to know that they must have brought all these books to his lectures in a wagon. Okay, Henry Grattan Guinness as is the custom of Tom Fress on Inquisition Update to bring book after book after book substantiating and proving the claims that he makes. Henry Grattan Guinness says, here is a copy of this work by Giraud published in 1687 entitled The Accomplishment of the Scripture Prophecies or The Approaching Deliverance of the Church proving that the papacy is the anti-Christian kingdom and that that kingdom is not far from its ruin, that the present persecution may end in three and a half years, after which the destruction of Antichrist shall begin, which shall be finished in the beginning of the next age, and then the kingdom of Christ shall come upon earth. Unquote. The papacy, the anti-Christian kingdom. That was what was believed by Giraud, the French Huguenot. Where is that belief today? It's the same belief that Protestants and Bible believers have had all the way back to the earliest Christians in apostolic times. Henry Grattan Guinness continues, he said, here's another work published at the same period by one of the exiled Huguenot ministers. Its title runs thus, quote, A New System of the Apocalypse, written by a French minister in the year 1685 and finished but two days before the dragoons plundered him of all except this treatise, unquote. The author anticipated that the reformed religion overthrown by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes would be again reestablished in three and one-half years, which it was in the most remarkable manner, though not just as he predicted. The great English Revolution, which brought about the reestablishment of Protestantism, followed three and one-half years after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. And these men lived to see it and to rejoice in it. The author of this little work points out the, fu- the futurity, that is, futurism, 
at the time of the vials on papal Rome, in which he was evidently correct. He's talking about futurism, the futurity at that time of the vials. In other words, the plagues that are going to come about on papal Rome. The judgment of papal Rome, the judgment of the great whore. Now he says, here is another Huguenot work of the same period, written by an exiled minister describing the way in which all Protestants throughout France had been forbidden to assemble for the worship of God under the severest penalties, and also forbidden to leave the country under pain of the galleys or even condemnation to death. This work traces in a very remarkable way the similarity of the experience of the Reformed Church in this, past, in, in this last great papal persecution to that of the Jews under Antiochus Epiphanes in the time of the Maccabees. It contains an appendix, <coughs> excuse me, it contains in an appendix the famous bull of Pope Clement XI, condemning a hundred Jansenist propositions as false, pernicious, injurious, outrageous, seditious, impious, and blasphemous, etc. The hundred propositions taken from the works of the Jansenists are given here, and they are all most excellent and in perfect harmony with the teachings of Scripture. Among them are the following. Proposition number 79. It is useful and necessary at all times and in all places and for all sorts of persons to study the Scripture and to understand its spirit, piety, and mysteries, unquote. <clears throat> now, you know that is a Protestant proposition. Rome tries to hide the Bible. Protestants focus on it, right? Now, here is proposition number 84. It is, to it is to close to Christian people the mouth of Jesus Christ to take from their hands the holy word of God or to keep it shut in taking from them the meaning and the means of understanding it. Let me read it again without stumbling. It is to close to Christian people the mouth of Jesus Christ to take from their hands the holy word of God or to keep it shut in taking from them the meanings, the means of understanding it. In other words, to take the Bible out of the hand of Christian people or to take away from them the means of understanding the scripture is to shut the mouth of Christ himself as far as they're concerned. Now, let me tell you, if you can't take the Bible out of God's people's hands, then you must find another way to confound them, to confuse them, to deceive them, and to overthrow them. And that was to take away from them the means of understanding the Scripture. I'm going to tell you how they took away the means of understanding correctly the scriptures. And that was simply by taking away any knowledge of the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy and all of its history. And to take away the understanding that was had and held by every Bible-believing Christian prior to our generation. Without the knowledge of that history, of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, the old world order, and without the knowledge of what true Bible-believing Christians believed prior to our time, they've stripped from us any way to really comprehend and to decipher the meaning of the scriptures, particularly these prophecies. And this point is made over and over and over and over again by Walt and myself and other people who are delving into this research. 
We have discovered the secret to their success of overthrowing Protestantism is to strip us of any knowledge of what the early Christians believed concerning these prophecies and to also obscure, if not completely obliterate, any knowledge of the historical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, the papacy. Now, here's another Protestant proposition from these French Calvinist Protestants, proposition number 85. To forbid the reading of Scripture, and particularly of the Gospel, to Christians is to forbid the use of light to the children of light. Let me read it again. To forbid the reading of Scripture, and particularly of the Gospel, to Christians is to forbid the use of light to the children of light, unquote. Which proposition also the Pope condemns as an insufferable and abominable doctrine, and adds, quote, we forbid to all the faithful of both sexes to think, teach, or speak on these propositions in any other way than as we lay down in this constitution or bull. And whoever shall teach, understand, or expound these propositions, or any of them, in public or private, in any other way than is laid down by the Pope, subjects himself to the severest censures and condemnations of the Church, and incurs the indignation of Almighty God and of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, unquote. All the propositions cited by Pope Clement XI, Antichrist Clement XI, in this bull, and condemned by him as scandalous, impious, blasphemous, unquote, are as scriptural as those we have quoted. I've mentioned Dabas among those exiled Huguenots. He was the author of a large and learned commentary upon the apocalypse of of considerable value, with which I must associate as belonging to the same period the the, the commentary on Revelation published by the learned Dutch professor Vitringa. Now, all these names... It would be very well if you could remember all of these names or refer to this book to get those names and look up their works and read them for yourselves to prove what their beliefs were and how they were consistent with historical Protestantism. He says, here he is again, holding up two more books. Here are copies of these two works. But Tringas was published in 1695, and the commentary by Dabas in 1720. They both belong to the historical school, okay? The historicist school of interpretation of Bible prophecy, and exhibit an erudition of the widest range, both secular and ecclesiastical, embracing Hebrew, Greek, and other literature bearing on the interpretation of prophecy. The well-known prophetic student Robert Fleming lived at the time of Vitringa and Dabas. He published in the year 1701 a small but remarkable work of which this is a copy entitled, quote, The Rise and Fall of Rome Papal, unquote. What a title for a book. I'd love to be able to write a book entitled The Rise and Fall of Rome Papal. Its theme is the relation of papal and prophetic chronology. Fleming shows, as others had done for many centuries, that the 1260 days of prophecy represent 1260 literal years and advocates their interpretation upon the intermediate or calendar scale, which would shorten the whole period by 18 years. Reckoning from the most important dates in the rise of the papacy and guided by the prophetic times, Fleming indicated two years then future, which would be marked 
in all probability by crises in the overthrow of the papal power, the years 1794 and 1848. He also mentions 1866. Now, it should be remembered that Fleming published his work in 1701 and that the French Revolution fell out at the first of the dates which he indicated. Interesting, isn't it? The French Revolution occurred at the first of the dates which he indicated. The Reign of Terror took place, as you'll remember, in 1793, and that the year 1848 brought another tremendous crisis in papal history. The revolution that year broke out in Paris on February 23rd, and before March 5th, every country lying between the Atlantic and the, and the Vistula had in a great or lesser degree been revolutionized. On March 15th, a fortnight after the fall of Louis Philippe, a constitution was proclaimed at Rome, and the Pope fled to Gaeta and was subsequently formally deposed from his throne from his temporal authority and an Italian republic proclaimed. That's right. In the very shadow of the Vatican, the Italian people rose up against the papacy, threw off the yoke of his tyranny, just stripped him of his temporal power. He was no longer a king to them because they shouted, he will no longer be a king over us. And they established their own independence, their own constitution, and their own civil governments, completely independent of the Pope. Would to God that the world, and most particularly the United States of America, would do likewise. Now he continues, the year 1866 was equally or even more important as introducing the series of papal defeats, which culminated four years later in 1870, in the overthrow of the papal monarchy in France and the fall of the temporal power of the Pope in Italy. Quote, Is it not a proof that this historical expositor Fleming was working on right lines and had seized the true clue that he should have fixed nearly a century beforehand and on the close of the 18th century as the commencement of the era of divine vengeance on the papal power and have pointed out within a single year the very central period of that signal judgment, unquote, and that he should have similarly indicated the years 1848 and 1866 as years of papal overthrow, saying with reference to the former, quote, we are not to imagine that this vial will totally destroy the papacy, though it will exceedingly weaken it, for we find it still in being and alive when the next vial is poured out. The vial which succeeds, he interprets, as the judgment on the Mohammedan power, the Islamic power, remember, especially as existing in Turkey. And by the vial which follows that again, the seventh vial, he understands the final destruction of Rome, or mystical Babylon. He says, quote, as Christ concluded his sufferings on the cross with his voice, it is finished. So the church's sufferings are concluded with a voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne of God and Christ there saying, it is done. And therefore with this doth the blessed millennium of Christ's spiritual reign on earth begin. About 50 years later than the time of Fleming, or in the middle of the last century, was published a work by a Swiss astronomer named de Chasso, entitled Historical, Chronological, 
and astronomical remarks on certain parts of the book of Daniel. A copy of this book exists in the British Museum. It demonstrates the astronomic character of the prophetic times. It proves in the clearest and most conclusive way that the 1260 years of prophecy and the 2300 years of prophecy and also the period of 1,040 years, which is their difference, are astronomic cycles of one and the same character. Lunar-solar cycles, or cycles harmonizing with the revolutions of the sun and the moon and affecting the order of time dealt with in the calendar. These discoveries are of the deepest interest. And as M.E. Chesso says, Quote, for many ages, the book of Daniel, and especially these passages of it, have been quoted and commented on by numerous and varied authors, so that it is impossible for a moment to call into question their antiquity. Who can have taught their author the marvelous relation of the periods he selected with solely lunar revolutions? Is it possible, considering all these points, to fail to recognize in the author of the book of Daniel, the creator of the heavens and of the hosts of heaven, of the earth, and the things that, of, that are therein, unquote. I cannot enlarge at the present time on De Chasso's discoveries. If you desire to know more about them, you'll find a chapter on the subject in my work on the approaching end of the age. That's right. Henry Grattan Guinness wrote another book entitled Approaching End of the Age. I must have a copy of that book so that I might read it even here on Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio and on Inquisition Update. Approaching End of the Age by Henry Grattan Guinness. Now he says, I must notice one more writer of the last century, the excellent Bishop Newton whose deservedly popular work on the prophecy has gone through so many editions. Newton acted on Lord Beacon's suggestion expressed in his Advancement of Learning that a history of prophecy was wanted in which every prophecy of the Scripture should be compared with the event, the historical event that fulfilled it. The 26th dissertation of Newton's work recapitulates his expression of the prophecies related to Romanism, the Roman Catholic Church. In it, he says, quote, the prophecies relating to popery are the greatest and most essential and the most striking part of the revelation. Imagine. The book of Revelation is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, yet this author, in agreement with me, by the way, says the prophecies, the biblical prophecies relating to popery are the greatest and most essential and the most striking part of the book of Revelation. That book which calls itself the revelation of Jesus Christ, spends its time describing the papacy. You want to know about Jesus Christ? Read the Gospels, and then you'll know who Jesus Christ is. But when you go to the book of Revelation and study about his antithesis, his antichrist counterfeit, the Pope of Rome, then you get a complete understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Amazing, isn't it? The revelation of Jesus Christ spends the lion's share of its time talking about the, the dealings and the doings of his antithesis, his counterfeit, the antichrist of Daniel and Paul and John, the papacy, the historical, the prophetic, and the biblical, and the only 
antichrist of the Bible. Again, listen to what he says. In it he says, quote, the prophecies relating to popery. Now you must understand by this he's saying the prophecies directly relate to the papacy and to no one else. He says the prophecies relating to popery are the greatest and most essential and the most striking part of the book of Revelation. Whatever difficulty and perplexity there may be in other passages, yet the application is obvious and easy. Popery being the great corruption of Christianity There are indeed more prophecies relating to that than to almost any other distant event. It is a great object of Daniel's and the principal object of St. Paul's as well of St. John's prophecies, and these considered and compared together will mutually receive and reflect light from and upon each other, unquote. In other words, these books, these prophecies all go together. It's God's voice speaking through three different men in three different generations, Daniel, Paul, and John. And who do they talk about but the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy? And they all go together. They're mutually Beneficial, they, they go together as the retellings of the same story three different ways. And it's without, without one or the other or any of those tellings, the picture is not complete. But what is most important for you to understand, that they speak of the papacy. And no one else. There's not even another candidate, not another runner-up in all of heaven or earth. I reiterate what I've said so many times. God made it like stumbling off a rock to discover in the scriptures who Jesus is, who the Messiah is. Why would he deal treacherously with his people for whom he died and suffered and who he redeemed from a Christless eternity with his own blood? Why would that same Savior then deal treacherously with those he saved with those whom he saved by keeping it secret, by making it a mystery, by making it so confusing to discover who the Antichrist is. God does not deal treacherously with his people, and he made it just as easy as stumbling over a stone to discover who his antithesis is, the Pope of Rome. Bishop Newton considered that the sounding of the seventh trumpet or pouring out of the third woe, the woe of the vials upon the papacy was still future in his day. And he was evidently correct as he lived before the time of the French Revolution. He held also that at the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the Christian Antichrist, the Jews would turn to the Lord and be restored to their own land, and says that the prophecies relating to the conversion and restoration of the Jewish people are simply innumerable. We must now in the first place, or rather the last place, briefly consider the progress made in prophetic interpretation during the present century. This is the century about which Henry Grattan Guinness lived and wrote and taught and preached. Henry Grattan Guinness, the end or the middle and rather the latter parts of, of the 19th century, 1865, 1875, the present century, according to Henry Grattan Guinness, he says, I have already said that the French Revolution, the French Revolution cast a flood of light upon the whole question of prophetic interpretation. It strongly confirmed the historic or the historicist view, including its leading feature, the year-day chronology of the prophetic times. Faber and Cunningham 
wrote very fully upon this subject during the first 20 years of the century, showing the true measure and the position of the seven times of prophecy as extending from the rise of the fourth monarchies to the fall of the fourth in the days in which we live, and of the three and one-half times as reaching from the rise of the rise to the fall of the papal power. Among the most valuable expositors who have succeeded these, I may mention Keith, who deals mainly with the evidential side of the prophetic interpretation. One of the most important works is entitled History and Destiny of the World and the Church According to Scripture, or The Four Monarchies and the Papacy. He quotes throughout, from first to last, the testimony of the Romanists themselves in confirmation of his assertions. His work is an unanswerable argument for the Protestant interpretation of the prophecy. I ask the listeners again, what is the Protestant or the Bible believer's interpretation of the prophecy? Clearly, that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible, and there is no other consideration. Now it says, the time would fail me to speak of the works of the well-known Bickerstaff, who to refer in detail to the many able writers in England, Scotland, Switzerland, Germany, Holland, and America, who within the last 50 years have expounded scripture prophecy on the historic principle, on the historicist principle. I can do no more than say a few sentences in closing about three of the greatest of these writers, Bishop Wadsworth, Reverend E.B. Elliott, and Professor Burks of Cambridge. The works of the late Bishop Wadsworth, that learned and eloquent commentator, demonstrate with perfect conclusiveness that Rome papal is the Babylon of the apocalypse. Wadsworth understood the Church of Rome better than any commentator. Eliot accepted. E-X-C-E-P-T-E-D. In other words, he's proclaiming Wadsworth unsurpassed except for Eliot in recent times. And he was familiar also with the entire history and literature of the Christian church. His testimony on the fulfillment of prophecy in papal Rome, that is the fulfillment of the Antichrist, the little horn, the, the man of sin is papal Rome, is such as to settle the question. Finally, for all intelligent and unbiased minds. Okay? So the issue has been settled long, long, long ago. Who is spoken of in the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John? It is none other than the papacy. The issue is settled. And anyone who brings this back up for question is obviously of a biased mind and if nothing else, lacks the basic intelligence to read and to understand. He says, the learned commentator Dean Alford, who was a semi-futurist, and we talked about others that were semi-futurists, and, and, and one in particular, Dave Hunt, in his book, A Woman Rides the Beast, he's well aware of papal history, he's well aware of the Protestant Reformation, he's well aware <clears throat> of how the papacy tried to destroy the Protestant Reformation, but he failed to recognize that the papacy throughout all its history was the fulfillment of the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, and he was looking to the future for the real one, for the final one. He was a semi-futurist. He was confused let not a single one of my listeners be confused. Henry Grattan Guinness was not confused. The Protestant Reformers were not confused. Those Bible-believing Christians before the Protestant Reformation were not confused. 
Those even at the rise of the papacy were not confused, and even those in apostolic times who read the scriptures, read the prophecies, stood under, uh, under the Apostle Paul's ministry, they knew who the Antichrist was, who the Antichrist would be, depending on what generation they lived in. This generation, our generation, is the only one of the Bible believers throughout history that has ever been deceived. And how were we deceived? By futurism. A departure from the historical belief. A departure from the historical belief. A departure from the biblical belief. A departure from the prophetic belief and the belief in fables. Papal fables. Jesuit fables. New World Order fables. His testimony on the fulfillment of prophecy in papal Rome is such as to settle the question once and for all, finally, for all intelligent and unbiased minds. The learned commentator Dean Alford, who was a semi-futurist, says, I do not hesitate to maintain that interpretation which regards papal and not pagan Rome, that is, papal and not pagan Rome, as pointed out by the harlot of this vision, Revelation chapter 17. Let me say it plainly. Revelation chapter 17 speaks of Rome papal, not Rome pagan, not the Rome of the Caesars, but the Rome of the popes. No equivocation in that language, is there? No futurism in that language either, is there? He says the subject has been amply discussed by many expositors. I would especially mention Petringa and Dr. Wadsworth. While quoting Dean Alford, I would warn you against the snare into which many have fallen of trusting themselves implicitly to the guidance of Greek scholars such as Alford, Trajellus, and Ellicott in the study of prophecy. These students of the latter of sacred writ, excuse me, those, these students of the letter of sacred writ have their place and their value and should stand high in our estimation but their special work did not qualify them for the comprehension of the far-reaching system of prophetic truth. The instrument they employ in their researches is the microscope, not the telescope. You cannot scan the starry heavens or the breadth of the earth with a microscope. You need a telescope for that. Greek scholars of such eminence are naturally short-sighted. They pore over manuscripts, words, letters, and points. They seldom grasp the meaning of history or prophecy as a whole. They generally neglect the philosophy of history and the light which astronomy has cast on the chronology both of history and prophecy. Besides this, they are too much influenced by traditional testimony, by the views of antiquity. The notions of the fathers as to the individual short-lived Antichrist, which is what is taught in futurism, the individual short-lived Antichrist, notions which grew up in the twilight of the early times, weigh more with them than the teaching of ages of subsequent experience. Wedded to the past, they are, bi- they are blind to the progressive of prophetic interpretation. They do not grasp the simple simplicity, the simple principle that the true interpreter of prophecy is neither traditional nor 
speculation, but ever-evolving history. Do you realize that the Bible, that Bible prophecy is interpreted by history? Because prophecy is simply history written in advance. And if you want to look for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, there's but one place to go. That is a good history book. And without that history book, without that good and accurate and truthful history book, you are blind to the fulfillment of prophecy. You cannot see the fulfillment of prophecy, and therefore you cannot see the delusion of the papacy, the Antichrist of Scripture. You cannot perceive that it is the Pope, the papacy that fulfills every prophecy in the Bible about the Antichrist, the man of sin, the little horn, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, you have been blinded. They couldn't take the Bible away from you, but they took away your ability to interpret and to recognize the fulfillment of these prophecies simply by stripping you of any knowledge of critical history, history that shows the perfect and complete fulfillment of those prophecies. You wonder why the world is so ignorant today about who the Antichrist is? You ask Christians up and down the street, who is the Antichrist? You get as, as many people as you will ask, you get a different answer. Why, why Jesus must play loose and fast with the souls that he died for, right? That this body called Christian is so confused about who the Antichrist is, it's a wonder they even know who Jesus is. Because there wasn't a true Bible believer before us that was ever confused on these issues. Not a one. They were unanimous in their belief. I mean, they sounded like mimics. If you read their writings, they were all on the same page, as Walt would say. Because they were all of the same spirit. They were, they were instructed from heaven. God does not confuse his people. God does not play loose and fast with their souls. He died for them. And his people believe the same things. There's your ecumenism. Unity and peace in the truth, the biblical, historical, prophetic, and spiritual truth. Is God divided amongst himself? Does God speak out of two sides of his mouth? Or does he speak with one tongue to one people, and never a deceiving word comes out of his mouth? He says they do not grasp the simple principle that the true interpreter of prophecy is neither tradition nor speculation, but ever-evolving history. That prophecy must be studied in the light of its fulfillment and the future in the light of the past. Let me give you an example of what he just said. You cannot know what the new world order is unless you know without a shred of doubt what the old world order was because they are one and the same. And unless you've been a regular listener to Inquisition Update or Walt's Babylon Mystery News Radio or another program like it, and there are not many, you are clueless as to what the old world order was, and therefore you are forever blinded to perceive correctly what the new world order is because they are one and the same. He says the prophecy must be studied in the light of its historical fulfillment and the future in the light of the past. 
prophecy is vast, mountainous, and far-reaching sight is needed for its elucidation. A Christian philosopher like Sir Isaac Newton, accustomed to the study of the facts of laws of nature and the entire course of history and chronology, is a far safer guide in this extensive subject than a Greek scholar whose whole business is the study of words. The man with the microscope sees small points uncommonly well, but he fails to perceive great general relations. As he does not steadily contemplate these relations, they produce no vivid impression upon him, and he is often led to conclusions totally at variance with the whole course of experience and even with the teachings of common sense. Not that all scholars, however, are short-sighted. Occasionally, scholars are met with likes, the likes of Reverend E.B. Elliott and Professor Burke, both fellows of the Trinity College, Cambridge, equally able to use the microscope and the telescope. Unquestionably, the most learned and able work ever written upon the book of Revelation is Mr. Elliot's Jorge, Jorge Apocalyptice. Mr. Elliot's Jorge Apocalyptice. The late Dr. Chandlish of Edinburgh, who, a no mean judge, describes Elliot as, quote, among the most learned, profound, and able expositors any of the books of Scripture have ever had, unquote. Makes you want to run right out to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, one of the great publishers and get a copy of this Horae Elliptica, doesn't it? I'm afraid it's not that easy. The truth is very hard to find. There is an online version of it. But trust me, it's over 1,800 pages, much of it is in Latin and Greek, and it is a monumental tome of Bible prophecy. And unless you are a scholar, and I'm not trying to dissuade anybody from reading that book, I'd love to sit down and be able to read that book for myself. It makes me almost tempted to go to try to go to school and learn a little Greek and Hebrew, and so I can read this monumental work by Dr. Eliot, Foray Apocalyptica. It's been suggested to me that I ought to spend the next two or three years on Inquisition Update trying to get through all 1,800 pages of that book. But I can tell you from experience, my listeners can only take about so much of me and only if they can understand what I'm saying. So, Hori Apocalyptica is going to have to be left to somebody else. Maybe God will choose you. And I hope if he does and you are scholarly enough to read and comprehend and understand and explain that book for everyone's understanding, that God empower you, you accept the challenge, and take it by the bull by the horns and and do that for Christ's sake. Mr. Elliot's Jorge Apocalyptica. He continues, he says, the late Dr. Chandlish of Edinburgh no mean judge describes Eliot as among, among the most learned, profound, and able expositors any of the books of Scripture have ever had. Wow. I wish there's no use wishing for something that'll never happen, but boy, would to God that those words could be spoken of me someday. Eliot's commentary on the apocalypse is to historic interpretation what Butler's analogy or Paley's famous work is to the evidence of Christianity, a solid foundation. It is learned, candid, and conclusive. It assumes nothing without ground. It deals with unquestionable facts, and that too with great fullness. It compares history with prophecy. Let me read it again. It compares history with prophecy in a more elaborate way at all points than any work which preceded it. 
In style, it is somewhat involved and overloaded, and its 10,000 references repel the superficial reader. But it will remain a masterpiece of exposition while the study of the sure word of prophecy endures. Tonight we've been talking about what was believed, how the prophecies of Paul, John, and Daniel were interpreted by post-Protestant Reformation Bible believers. You have seen that they were all unanimous in their belief that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture. They are the greatest expositors of Bible prophecy and history in Protestant history. We ought to get their works and read them. We ought to share them with others. And part of my task was to share with you Romanism and the Reformation. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, Without our Savior, we're total lost.